In this next part of chapter four, we're going to look at cellular respiration. You can see here uh, are the learning objectives that we're covering in this chapter, focusing around cellular respiration, the formula itself, the stages, and then working through the stages, the processes that are going to occur, and then at the end of this to look at proteins and fats as well as anaerobic respiration. So why are we looking at cellular respiration? Well, again, remember uh, in our enzyme section of chapter four, we talked about metabolism, and uh, which was the rate of chemical reactions that occur, and the fact that enzymes can speed up those reactions um, and, and help those things to either be broken down or to build things up. And so one of the things that we know about food is that food has to first be broken down by the digestive system, and then the materials that are released have to be then transported through the bloodstream to our cells. And that once those materials are inside of the cells, the food energy from them can be converted into a usable form of chemical energy and the process that takes food energy and converts it into a chemical form that we can actually use is known as cellular respiration. Now uh, definition of cellular respiration is just that. It's a series of reactions of chemical reactions or metabolic reactions and their sole purpose is to convert energy. To convert energy from food into what we know as ATP. And ATP is the usable form of energy that our cells have. Now, as far as ATP is concerned, a couple things to note about it. First off, energy is stored in the electrons of chemical bonds that hold ATP together. And so when these chemical bonds are broken, um, energy is going to be produced. So if we look at ATP and the structure of it, ATP is, it stands for adenosine triphosphate. And so that term or adenosine triphosphate stands for the fact that it's made of uh, a base known as adenine, you can see it here, the sugar ribose, which you can see here, and then three phosphate groups that are bound together. Now the three phosphate groups are bound together by chemical bonds and energy is stored between them. And so what it talks about uh, on page 74 is that as far as these are concerned, that these um, there's energy that's found between these three phosphates that holds these two together and the energy is kind of similar to the energy that you would feel if you held negative poles of a magnet together. You, you notice if you ever uh, put these together they kind of they repel each other and so there's energy that's present there and so there's energy present then in the three negatively charged phosphates and so what happens is as you break the chemical bonds that hold these together, energy can then be released. And so it's kind of equivalent to a dart gun. You think about um, the first thing you have to do if you want to use a dart gun is you have to push the dart in and compressing that spring. And so you're taking the energy from your muscles and you exert that on the dart to push it in and so it's converted to a stored form of energy that's just waiting for you to pull the trigger. And as you pull the trigger on that dart gun, it releases energy that causes the dart to go through the air. And so in the same sense, as you remove and break down the chemical bonds in these phosphates and you remove a phosphate here, it also gives off ATP. Now, why is ATP so important? Well, ATP serves some very basic functions in our cells. First off, ATP is used for mechanical work. Now, we say mechanical work, what we're basically meaning is movement here. So movement of cells, we think about things that, that power the movement of cells, um, like flagella or cilia. Those things only work if ATP is present. We also know that ATP functions in transport work. We talked about in Chapter 3, active transport, which is pumping substances across a membrane um, using ATP because it's moving from a low concentration to a high concentration. Uh, we also know that ATP is used in chemical work, so making molecules uh, like carbohydrates and proteins and nucleic acids. So ATP is a very valuable um, source of energy for our cells. Now, one of the things that we know about our cells is as our cells are using ATP to do that work, they're going to continuously use up ATP that's present. And so there has to be a process established to regenerate and to replenish our ATP supply. That process is known as cellular respiration. Now, when you hear the word respiration, you probably think of um, our form of respiration, which is breathing, taking in oxygen and giving off carbon dioxide. But cellular respiration is more than just the process of breathing. Cellular respiration not only requires oxygen here, 
That's, that's what aerobic means, requiring oxygen. But sea respiration also is going to require some form of food energy. Uh, and here, uh, the more, more, most common one that we talk about is the sugar glucose. Now, if you look at the formula here, you'll see that in cellular respiration, in the aerobic form, what cells do is they take glucose, which has the chemical form of C6H12O6. Your cells also take oxygen, which is the O2. And by using those materials, cellular respiration gives off three products. Water, carbon dioxide, which we exhale, and then ATP. Now, before we actually work through the stages here, first off, we want to know that cellular respiration is mostly going to occur in the mitochondria of a cell. Well, why? Well, if you remember in Chapter 3 when we talked about the parts of the cell, mitochondria is known as the powerhouse. And the reason it's known as the powerhouse is because this is where it can generate the most ATP, or the cell can. Uh, and then again, this is known as aerobic cellular respiration, so we know that it's going to require oxygen in order to finish out this process. Now, a quick reminder is that enzymes, remember, are involved in metabolism. Enzymes have the job of speeding up these reactions. And so not only are they involved in the metabolism of food, but enzymes are also going to be um, involved in producing ATP. A quick reminder, we also established in the last section of Chapter 4 that enzymes are coded for by genes. And so because of that, not only is metabolic rate affected um, by genetics, but also the rate of cellular respiration. Now, if we look at the stages of cellular respiration, your book establishes that there are three main stages. Stage one known as glycolysis, stage two, citric acid, and then stage three is the electron transport chain. Now, before we move into those steps, there's one really important piece to the puzzle that we need to make sure that we establish. See, we just said that in the formula of respiration, uh, they're going to require oxygen, but the cell also requires some type of, of food source, which we say is glucose. And so what's going to happen to glucose in the first two stages is that glucose is going to be broken down. And so as glucose is broken down, electrons are going to be removed. But you don't want to lose electrons. Um, and we'll talk about the fact a little bit later on, but electrons can be used to generate energy. And so what's going to happen is there has to be some structure present in order to catch these electrons that have been removed and carry them, one, so they don't damage cell structures, and two, so that they can be used at the end of this to help produce more energy. So there's two electron carriers that are utilized in cellular respiration. One of them is known as NAD, the other is FAD. And so kind of in your mind, um, establish that NAD and FAD are basically taxi cabs. And their job as a taxi cab is to pick up electrons. As they pick up electrons, they're also going to pick up hydrogens and carry them to their final destination, which is the electron transport chain. Um, and so both of these, again, if you just kind of have in your mind, they're just taxi cabs picking up electrons and carry them to their final destination. So let's look at the stages then of cellular respiration. So the first step starts on page 77, known as glycolysis. Now, the word glycolysis, if you break that word down, glyco obviously refers to the sugar glucose, lysis refers to breaking or bursting. So we said that the formula for glucose is C6H12O6. So this six carbon glucose is going to be broken in half. So if you have six of something and you break it in half, you get two groups of three. So when glucose is broken down, it's turned into two three carbon molecules that are known as pyruvic acid. Now, a couple things to know about glycolysis. First off, it's occurring in the cytosol. So we're not yet in the mitochondria. We're outside of the mitochondria in the cytosol, that semi-fluid that's found inside the cell. Second, we know that this step itself does not require oxygen. And in breaking down glucose into these two groups of pyruvic acid, a couple things are going to happen. First off, it's going to give off a net of 2 ATP. And we already said electrons are going to be released. Now remember, we don't want to just release these electrons into the cell. We've got to have somebody catch them. So the taxi cab NAD is going to catch these electrons. And as it does, it's also going to catch hydrogen, forming NADH. So the products then of glycolysis would be two groups of pyruvic acid, a net gain of two ATP, and then two NADHs because they caught these released electrons and hydrogens. Now after glycolysis, the pyruvic acid is going to be what we call decarboxylated. So it's going to lose a carbon dioxide. Now remember, to begin with, pyruvic acid was a three carbon molecule. So if you remove a carbon, 
it then becomes a two carbon molecule. And these two carbon fragments are then going to move into the mitochondria where the rest of cellular respiration can occur. So that moves us into step two or stage two of cellular respiration which is known as the citric acid cycle. Now keep in mind we just took our six carbon glucose we broke it into two groups of three carbon called pyruvic acid. We then f uh, further metabolized them by removing a carbon and turning them into two carbon groups. And so now we've moved into the mitochondria, specifically into the matrix of the mitochondria, which is the semifluid space that's found inside of the mitochondria. And through the citric acid cycle, we're going to further reduce these molecules and harvest their electrons. So as this cycle spins, it's going to give off some products. Now keep in mind, there were two groups here. Remember when glucose was split, it was two pyruvates. So we had two two-carbon molecules, so that means this cycle is going to have to spin twice. And as it spins twice, it's going to produce two ATP. It's going to release four carbon dioxide molecules. And in the process, it's going to release a lot of electrons. Now remember, we don't just want to lose these electrons, we want to catch them. Who catches them? NAD and FAD do our little taxi cabs, turning them into NADH and FADH2. And so through these two spins of the citric acid cycle, it's going to make six NADHs and two FADH2. So real uh, fast before we move on, products of citric acid, as it spins twice, two ATP, four carbon dioxide, six NADHs, and two FADH2s. So that moves us to the final step of cellular respiration, which is known as electron transport and ATP synthesis. Now, uh, keep in mind, the electron transport chain is a series of proteins. They're found in the mitochondria, specifically in the cristae, or the foldings of the mitochondria. And basically what this is, is it's a conveyor belt of electrons. So it gives the cell a chance to take those taxi cabs that have been collecting these electrons, to dump these electrons out, and as these electrons are going to be transported down this chain, it's going to use these in order to give off energy. So, step one of electron transport, NADH and FADH2 are going to drop off their electrons. As they drop off their electrons, they're also going to drop off their hydrogens. Electrons are going to be moved through these series of protein chains. And as they move, the hydrogen concentration is going to increase as they move into what we call the inner membrane space. So you'll notice from this picture that as electrons move, hydrogens are going to be pumped across as well. Now, when hydrogens pump across, it's going to change the charge. Um, now, keep in mind that these charged hydrogens, they can't move across the membranes by themselves. So it requires an enzyme present, known as ATP synthase, to pass them through these protein channels. And as they're passed through these channels, it's going to cause the production of ATP. You'll notice it gives you a specific number here. 26 ATP is produced just by pumping hydrogens through these protein channels. And then at the very end of this electron transport chain, you'll find oxygen combining with electrons, which also means it's going to combine with hydrogens to produce water. Now, one final thing to note here is that, yes, glucose is very much so used in cellular respiration. But if carbohydrates such as glucose are unavailable, fats can also be used to produce ATP. Now, if you remember in Chapter 3, fats or lipids are known as our long-term energy storage, so they can be broken down to give off energy. They're not your first choice. Carbohydrates would be the first choice. But if there are no carbohydrates, fats can be used to give off energy. And just like that, if carbohydrates and fats are not available, proteins can also be used to give off energy. Remember, proteins would be your last resort because proteins serve lots of other functions in the cell, and so you wouldn't want to use them for energy if you did not have to.